Good morning. Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. Would you stand with us? If you don't know, Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Easter, and it's the day that we remember when Jesus marched into Jerusalem on the donkey, and all the people, they threw their cloaks down on the floor, they cut palm branches, that's why we call it Palm Sunday, and they laid it on the floor for the king, and they said, Hosanna in the highest. Yes. Hosanna in the highest. So today as we worship, that's what we're going to do. We're going to worship him, praise him. He is worthy of our praise, worthy of being exalted. We're going to sing about his grace. We're going to sing about what he's done for us. And we're going to sing that he is worthy. Yes. He is worthy. Yes, so if you need just a second to remind your heart, he is worthy. Take that second because he deserves it. He deserves our praise. He deserves our praise. Jesus, we worship you today. We give you praise. We magnify you. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for who we are in you. Thank you. We lay down our cloaks and our palm branches for you today, Jesus, because you deserve it. You deserve it. Yes.
the melody you surround me with the song of deliverance from my enemies till all my all my fears are gone I'm no longer some I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. Thank you, Jesus. Your word. Your word. From my mother's womb, you have chosen. been born again and to God's family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child
would be of when we get to heaven. And instead of saying, you are, we would say, you were. You were worthy of it all. Yes, Lord. You were worthy of it all. I don't know about you, but lately I have been enjoying worship so much just to be, to be in the presence of Jesus. It says that when Jesus was crucified, the, the veil was torn. And so we can enter in right into the Holy of Holies and bow before our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Even if you feel unworthy today, God says, come. There's no condemnation. He loves you. He wants to have an encounter with you. Can I just say that you are not here just to take up space? Jesus wants to meet you right where you are at. So if you come in here and you're burdened down with all kinds of challenges and you're worried about situations or you just want to simply praise God. There's never a moment that he is not worthy to be praised. The psalmist says, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, the name of our God is always worthy to be praised. Don't let the enemy steal your praise. That's your greatest weapon in your season of challenges. Because you can worship through your problems. You can worship where circumstances are not right. You can sing a song to Jesus. You might just have to say the name of Jesus so the darkness can be removed from your life today. And so let's just go one more time and say worthy of it all. He's worthy of it all. And as much as I love the instruments, I love to hear the voices. And so, Cecily, if you could just sing us in a chorus and instruments, could you just lovingly lay down your talents for a moment? Let's join in with the heavenly choir and sing, He is worthy of it all. You and can I go ahead? Let's sing that one more time. He's worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Can I get an amen to Jesus, a hallelujah. He is worthy to be praised. So let's just take a moment with Jesus. Before we move on to the next thing, let's just have a moment where you access the holies of holies right now. And more than anything, Jesus simply wants you to bring yourself, all of you, no shame, no guilt, no judgment, no condemnation. Jesus just tells you to come as you are. Bring your families, bring your heart, bring your worries, bring your concerns. He says that you can cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And so if you want an encounter with Jesus, just tell him. 
Where do you want the encounter? What part of your life, what part of your heart that you want Jesus to meet you? He knows specifically what you're going through right now. Maybe there's a decision in life that you need to make. And you're praying to God, God, give me wisdom. I don't know what road to take. Maybe there's something on your mind. You're walking through an anxious season, a season of darkness or dryness. And you're saying, God, if you don't light my world up, God, I don't know where to go. Maybe you're in a season where your body's not cooperating and the doctors are saying certain things to you that are scaring you. Or you want to intercede on behalf of somebody that's in a situation right now where there's a physical challenge. You say, God, meet my loved one with healing today. Whatever it is, we can come to Jesus. So have your moment with Jesus, and after some time, we'll pray us out. Our Heavenly Father, we declare this morning that you are worthy of it all. There's no God that is greater, no Father more loving, no Savior more sacrificial than Jesus our Lord. God, we thank you for coming to save us, to redeem us to die for us a death that you didn't deserve to die, but you died anyway. And so, God, we pray for specific encounters, for places that you need to go, where people need to meet you, Lord God. I pray for every mind. I pray for every heart. I pray for every soul. I pray for every circumstance right now in the name of Jesus. And I ask for your healing power because you are Jehovah Rapha. We call on a great physician to bring healing in bodies here and bodies we are interceding for. God, we pray that, Lord, you would free minds, that you would cast out depression, that you would cast out anxiety, that you would cast out suicidal thoughts. God, I pray that you would restore homes and families and marriages. God, I pray that you would save souls. If there's a soul in here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, would you add to your kingdom? Would you open blind eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive that you are Jesus and there's no other besides you? And so, God, we thank you that you desire encounters with us people that are not even worthy to be in your presence, but you make us worthy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. We pray that you would fill us afresh with your spirit. 
because we need you, God, more than anything. So we desperately cry out, Holy Spirit, if you don't move. <laughs> In fact, God, we expect you to move. So, God, move mountains today. Move boulders in the name of Jesus. And, God, we will forever give you all the glory, honor, and praise because this is all for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Can we give God a shout of praise? He is worthy to be praised. Before you take a seat, why don't you greet your neighbor next to you? Tell them hello this morning. Good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing today? <laughs> Who's glad to be in the house of the Lord? David said, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of God. I want to welcome our online audience. And I do believe our youth in the house. Any youth in the house? Anyone 18 or less? Don't raise your hand if you're in your 30s. I, you know, <laughs> y'all want to be young adults. I understand. I understand. Um, so glad that you have come to, to join us. My name is Dwayne. I have the honor and privilege of serving as our campus pastor. And thank you. Praise the Lord. Um, I want to just honor. Can I honor the team and leaders that were here supporting us while my wife and I were gone? We were traveling for kids' sports. We were in five different cities over the last three weeks. Um, because you know those moments with your children, they go just like that. You have to be at every one. Because the window is closing fast <laughs> on them. So again, we welcome you in the name of Jesus. We are going through the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 10. So if you are in need of a Bible, please raise your hand. We will be there. We will make reference to Palm Sunday. Aren't you glad that it's Palm Sunday? It's Passion Week. It is why Jesus came. He didn't come simply to be born, but he came to die for you and I to save us from the greatest disease, and that is being separated uh, from the Lord. So Matthew chapter 10 is where we were basically spending most of our time. We may creep over to Matthew chapter 21. Um, I want to celebrate a few things before we go into our Bible study. Yesterday, we had Feeding South Florida. Anybody was a part of that yesterday? And so around 7 a.m., folks came and we set up. We prayed that God would hold back the rain. But in, uh, uh, in all honesty, when we decided to partner with Feeding South Florida, we decided to partner with another church. So I don't know if you know this, at 2.30 in, at this particular campus, there is another church that speaks, that's all Spanish church. It's a Latin church called Living Waters. And during COVID, um, they were basically pushed out of their space. And so two years ago, he said, Pastor, would you allow me to meet at your church? And for two years, they've been meeting because this house doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. And so if we can help another church out, we do that. So we partnered with that church, and we had 60 volunteers. We gave over 150 bags of food, y'all. And so more than the physical food. So the idea was, obviously, we weren't given just a bag in the name of Calvary Chapel or the name of Living Waters. We were given the bag of food in the name of Jesus. And so after every person got their bag of food, we asked them if they needed prayer. And can I just say, we started off with four prayer counselors. We ended up with 16 prayer warriors praying for people as they left. And people were in tears. And you think about what people are walking through right now in this season of life. Obviously, sometimes we think about how easy it is to open our refrigerators and have food ready to cook. Who knows what these people are going through? 
So we have an opportunity to give a bag in the name of Jesus. I got a few uh, funny stories, too. So we had gotten all these boxes. So basically a big truck just comes, dumps a bunch of food. So teams have to sort out all the potatoes, the green peppers. So we had all these, bo these boxes in the dumpster. So the dumpster was full. And we were like, we're not going to have anywhere to put our garbage for Sunday. So in the midst, in the midst... Of us even thinking about that, here comes the Boynton Beach dumpster truck. So we were like, the Holy Spirit told that dumpster truck, <laughs> like the first stop on your route is 3190 Hyperluxo Road. Because God is doing the work. But God did amazing. So we're praying seeds were planted. We invited them to Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And so we'll see what God does. See what he does. Continue to pray. Um, I want to let you know a couple of th other things, too. The ladies' Bible study is not meeting tomorrow. Um, can we give it up for our ladies in the house? Ladies, we love you. Thank you for being moms and grandmas and wives and soon-to-be wives and singles and teenagers. We thank you for being part of our house. That will resume on uh, April 1st. Um, we also have our freedom group starting. If you've never been part of a freedom group, it's an opportunity to go through a seven-week study and an encounter. And we have seen people get set free in the name of Jesus because you know Jesus frees people. I, the last time I checked, who has been freed from some things in Jesus' name? And so we're starting that Freedoms Groups after uh, Easter. And so we have this video that we wanted to show you about how that experience looks. So guys, could you cue that video for us? Amen. And so we, we are actually looking for some more ladies to, to help us out. We have some men's groups, and I have co-led that, and it's amazing to see. We know freedom is a journey. It's not something you can just snap out of in seven weeks. But, man, if you're in a, in a season of life where you say, God, man, I, I need to be free from some things. I need to be free from some things that are still connected to me from my past or some present things that you're going through. Sign up for one of our freedom groups. If you feel called to lead one, please uh, lead one. The last announcement is Good Friday is this Friday. Did you realize this? Right? So <laughs> we are having one service on Good Friday. That is happening at 630. We will have communion. Uh, I believe there's no child care. Let me just get my child care stuff ready because family ministry will kill me if I don't get this right. So no child care, 630. That will be a family-style service. On the 30th, we will be having our Easter egg hunt. So can somebody say Easter egg hunt? Easter All right. Y'all got to say that with a little bit more oomph. Easter egg hunt. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so bring your kids. That is happening all at 11 a.m. on March 30th. And then March 31st, we are having three services. 7.30, 9.30, and 11.30. But because our 9.30 service is typically our largest service, we're asking if you don't need child care during our 7.30, which we won't, Come to that service. It'll be more like a sunrise service, 930, 1130, because you know most people will come on Resurrection Sunday. And so we pray that they come, but can I just say, add a prayer to that. Prayer that they pray that they would stay. Not because Calvary Chapel put on a good Easter performance but because they met Jesus when they came on Resurrection Sunday. And so we're going to pray that prayer. Parking is going to be a nightmare. Service is going to be crazy. But who cares? Why? Because on that Sunday, he got up. 
and we're going to celebrate the fact that he rose again. And so let's, let's make room for our guests and just pray that God would do an amazing work across all of our campuses. That's it in the way of announcements. Would you mind, if you don't mind, please stand as we read God's word together. We're going to read Matthew chapter 10. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. And it reads, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who was called Peter, his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans, Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you for your word. It's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing down to the bone and marrow to judge the intents of the heart. And so, God, let your word meet our hearts. Let it be a mirror to our soul. God, make it applicable to all of us today. And as we always pray together as a body Lord, may we decrease and you increase, God. And God, I, I put my sermon before you and I say, God, let it, let it be your notes, your words, not the words of a man. And allow what is said, Lord, to change and transform. Lord, we don't want to walk out the same way we walked in. So, God, we pray for those encounters to happen personally. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. You may have a seat. I've heard it said that the church does not have a mission. Rather, the mission has a church. Let me say that again. I've heard it said the church does not have a mission, which means the church didn't create the mission. The mission of God existed way before the church. So rather, the mission has a church. And so we join God on this mission to redeem souls that started way back in the garden when God desired to redeem mankind. And, and God calls us to join this mission, the word called in, in verse 1, it's this invitation to God to participate in this kingdom work. I want to remind you, God doesn't need you or I to complete his mission. The mission of God has been all through the threads and the pages of the Bible. God somehow does invite people to participate in this missional work of God. And so he invites these 12, which we'll focus on, to, to do something that seems impossible. You know, that, that God sometimes calls you to impossible things. You ever had God call you to something and you say, God, there's no way that's going to work. Anybody ever had that happen? And if you didn't, you're all lying because you know there's certain things that God calls you. He, he called a virgin to bear a child. That's impossible. He called 12 men. To go change the world. Now, I don't know about you, if he was going to start his greatest work of redemption, which was the church, I would not have chosen the 12 guys that he chose. 
But at a moment's notice in the book of Acts chapter 1, he says, but I'm going to empower you. I'm going to give you authority. And then Jesus leaves. And I think about that. I go, if I was one of the 12, I'd be like, is he coming back down? <laughs> because he's saying, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Samaria, in, in Judea, and to the other parts of the world. And so because of these 12 men, that the 12 men obedience to God, we are the ends of the earth. 2,000 years ago, Jesus dies, he raises, he leaves this, this idea of, of starting the church with these 12 men, and we are a result of that church. But I want to tell you something. If God calls you to something impossible today, I want to remind you all things are possible. Can I get an amen to that? All things. Sometimes things are impossible, man, but, but, but our impossible is God's reality. And God could do anything. So what's the context of this scripture? Before we even get into Matthew chapter 10, at the end of Matthew 9, Jesus implores the disciples. Up until this point, they've been watching Jesus heal. They've been watching Jesus deliver from demons. They've been watching people, God, Jesus free people. And he says at the end of 9, he says, pray. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Can I just tell you, today the harvest is still plentiful, and the laborers are few. And he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. And all this time they've been watching Jesus do the work, and now Jesus says, I'm going to empower you. I'm going to give you authority to do the work. Like I said, Jesus doesn't need us, but he invites us to participate. But he doesn't leave us without equipment. He says, I'm going to give you now authority to heal the sick, to free those that are demonically possessed. I'm going to give you this authority to heal, every, to drive out. I'm going to give that authority to you. But I want to remind you, we stand on the authority of Jesus. So there's confidence in that authority, but that authority is not given to everyone. What do I mean by that? If you don't know Jesus, you cannot borrow authority from a Savior that you are not in relationship with. You see it in the book of Acts. Some people try to buy this authority. Or some people try to call out this authority. But it's those that Jesus calls and he empowers them, gives them authority over these things. So, so my title for this message is called Mission Impossible. Better than any Tom Cruise movie you can go to. <laughs> Or you can see in a the theater. But I have for you four requirements for an impossible mission. Four requirements. Not options. Not out of convenience. Because I was thinking about that. I mean, it would be cool if it was convenient to serve Jesus. It would be cool if it, it met your timeline. But, but can I just say, we serve a God that's very disruptive. And when you get a job description, I don't know about you, if you ever applied for a job and you got a job title, whatever it might be, whatever profession you desire or the profession you work in, you cannot tell the company, well, I see your job description, but, I, but I've created my own. They would say, well, today is your last day. I mean, I mean, I didn't hire you, so you created your job description. I hired you because there's a job description that I've given you. And it's the same. If you're going to join this mission work, these are not options. These are requirements. Can somebody say requirement with me? Requirements. So if you are a note taker, the first point is this. An impossible mission requires you to be called and readily available. What do I mean by that? Everyone that's invited to the work and mission of God doesn't make room on their calendar for Jesus. God doesn't need ability. He needs availability. And, and if I was to ask you, um, 
if you looked at your calendar, how, how much availability are you giving Jesus today? I don't know. I don't know what that looks like in terms of your weekly schedule, but, but is there room for Jesus on your calendar to even be part of this mission? You see, when Jesus calls Matthew, Matthew is behind a tax collector's booth doing his daily duties, and Jesus looks at Matthew and he tells him, follow me. And immediately, he leaves. Four fishermen probably having a successful business. They're going to take over dad's business. Jesus says, to follow me, they drop their nets. I'm not asking you to give up your career, but if Jesus is asking you to follow him in this mission work, are you available? Not tomorrow. Well, Jesus, man, I feel really convicted. Well, let me check my calendar. Well, I don't got room for Jesus at least for another three weeks. What does your calendar say? I was thinking that Jesus had to, I'm sorry, Jesus saw something in Matthew behind that tax collection booth. He saw potential. He saw somebody's heart that was ready. But Matthew also saw something in Jesus that makes you want to give up the life that you're leading. Because he doesn't just invite you from something. He invites you to something. What would make somebody give up a successful business to follow Jesus? There has to be something greater in what Jesus is offering than what I have now. And so when you begin to weigh the scales, it's not just what's on your calendar. How are you weighing Jesus in your order of priorities and his ability to fulfill your purpose that God has given you? I feel like these are defining moments in life. You ever made a decision that defines you? Not like a decision to say, well, I'm going to take 95 or the turnpike and maybe I'll see that movie today or whatever. There are certain parts in your life that God gives you defining moments. He says, when you make this decision, it's going to change your life forever. And it will be the best decision. I, I want to just tell you this. This is not even in my notes. The only way that you will have a fulfilled life is following Jesus. I guarantee you. You will never find fulfillment out there. You can try. Try as you might. But the life that you're going to find fulfillment is the one that you walk out the will of God to the best of your ability. Not on your own. Based on the Holy Spirit that guides you and is your advocate. So an impossible mission requires you to be called. God invites everyone. He died for the world, but he also says, are you ready to go? Even when you don't understand it. <laughs> Even when it doesn't make sense, it can change your life forever. It changed these 12 men. In verse 2, it says, these are the names. He goes through all the names. And can I just say, these are not the best of the crop in Israel. These are not the college graduates. These are not the CEOs. These are fishermen, a tax collector, an insurrectionist, a zealot who was against Israel. These are not the smartest people. These are not the, the people that you would recruit that has the Jeep, that, that, you know, the valedictorians out of high school. So what does that tell you and I? You got a shot. Like, <laughs> you're in good company. You might not think you're good enough for Jesus today, but man, if he calls you, just be ready. You don't got to show him no degrees. You don't got to show him no achievements. You don't got to show him anything. Just come as you are. So these are the ones. <laughs> I got to calm down. I haven't been here a couple of weeks. I got to relax. <laughs> I got to bring it down. Verse 5. Verse 5. These 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. The word, it's interesting because Jesus says, I, I want you to see the movement of Jesus. He calls them disciples. 
which basically means I want you to learn for a while. You don't got to be the best student, but just hang with me. But then he calls them apostles. So can I just say, when you step into this calling, Jesus doesn't just see the present you. He sees the future you already. And so he's like, I'm, I'm bringing you because I'm going to send you somewhere. You're going to go accomplish some things on behalf of me. And so he sent, there, these are the apostles. He says, go to the lost house, lost house of Israel. Go to the lost. Don't go to the Gentiles or any other town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. What I think when Jesus is saying, if you want to bring it to our context, is go to the lost house of Israel, which means, Paul says in Romans 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, right, because it's the power of God to redeem souls, right? But he says, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And I would say the, the relevancy of that is practice in your own hometown. Practice with what's familiar to you, right? Go to your family. How many people have family members that don't know Jesus? How many of you have been praying for those family members that don't know Jesus? How many of you have coworkers that don't know Jesus? How many of you have neighbors that don't know Jesus, right? How much of them know you know Jesus? I mean, you could talk about March Madness all day long, but do they know that you know Jesus? Where do you go every Sunday morning? Well, I just, I go fellowship somewhere. I don't know where. I just. <laughs> go practice on them. <laughs> and, and I love that about Jesus. He's like, man, sometimes the hardest people to share the gospel with is your own people. Your own people, your own blood. <laughs> Why? Because they know who you were before you met Jesus. But go practice on them. Go, go, to, the, go to your neighbors. But, but here's what I want you to bring. Obviously, I want you to bring my authority with you. But, but I'm going, I'm giving you power, not just to share me, but here's what I'm giving you power to do. I'm giving you power to, to heal. I'm giving you power to restore. I'm giving you power to, to free. And so God is going to use you in your circle of influence based on what he's given you. How many people you know need healing today? They don't, they don't just need Jesus. They need Jesus to heal them. How many people need hope when they can't find food? They need more than the food. They need Jesus. So it's not about the bag, but it's about the one that provides the bag. And so you could be the one that says, well, I don't know what you're going through in life. And your idea is not that you go to them, you beat them over the head with all the scriptures that you memorized in Bible class. But the idea is that you pray for them. You see, so I can't tell you how many cars were driving through that were crying. And you ask them, what do you need prayer for? At that point, it wasn't about the bag. It was about that heart that needed to meet Jesus. You know people like that. You may run into somebody like that at the store. So it's not a just about being readily available like, he's, oh my, God, I'm ready. Use me wherever I walk. Use me. He says the kingdom of heaven has come near. I want to switch over to Matthew chapter 21 because I want to do honor to the triumphal entry. Because I think about today being Palm Sunday and why Jesus came. Interesting 30 years, Jesus quietly learning under the, 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 the parenting of Mary and Joseph. It doesn't say when Joseph died, but he's simply a carpenter. And for three years, he begins to, to bring the kingdom of God near. 
But the whole purpose Jesus came was to die. And so when we read this, Matthew chapter 21, verse 8, it says, A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is who? Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. What gets me about that is Hosanna means save now. But, but the one thing that I want when, when God says, hey, the kingdom of God is drawn near. Can I just say the kingdom of God is here yeah. now. And I think, and, and, and maybe, I, I pray you don't see this as, a, as an indictment against the church, but maybe this convicts you. I believe that sometimes we sense that the kingdom of God is only a Sunday experience. Well, we were the kingdom on Sunday, but what about the other six days of the week? Weren't we the kingdom yesterday when we were handing out the food? Don't you represent God's kingdom tomorrow when you go to your job? Can I get an amen, somebody? Wherever you go, because you represent God's kingdom, it doesn't matter. In your house, at your job, at Publix, it don't matter where you go. Driving on 95 or the turnpike, you are representative of the kingdom of God if you are a child of God today. And I, wanna, I want you to realize that as you walk into your environments, you represent a kingdom that is not of this world, but dwells through God's people here. So when Jesus says freely give because you are freely received, can you? I'm so thankful that I didn't have to pay my way into the kingdom of God. I didn't have to pay for salvation. It was the grace of God on my life and your life. Can I get an amen, somebody? Can we praise God real quick there? So an impossible mission requires you to be called and readily available. Let's continue. We're going to do a spiritual reading marathon. We're going to read from verse 9 to verse 25. Are you ready? All right, let's go. Verse 9. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or staff. For the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that town. Verse 16, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will, this is guaranteed, you will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> brother will betray brother to death. And the father, his child, children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be what? Saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Verse, 26, verse 24, the student is not above the teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teacher and servants like their masters, if the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? Stop right there. Y'all did good. Second point is this. Second requirement is an impossible mission requires you to be obedient and completely dependent. What do I mean by that? God is not looking, like I said before, God is not looking for gifted people. He's looking for obedient 
people and those that are completely dependent. Why? Because you realize the empowerment that we get from God to do anything never started with you so you can never take credit for it. And God is very specific about his missional instructions, and it begins to shift. This is not just the lost house of Israel now. God is preparing them to launch the church. The same things that you see happening to me, one, he's going to be a witness to them because all the things that are ha going to happen, he says, you will be handed over. Jesus was handed over. You will be flogged. Jesus was flogged. You will be arrested. Jesus was arrested. So this is what Jesus is saying. Hey, the mission is not going to get easier. It's going to get harder. And you know, sometimes in life, you're waiting for things to get easier. And they don't. Can I just say, they won't. I, I, like I wouldn't be doing my job as a pastor to tell you that life is not rosy all the time. But because you have Jesus, you can get through the harder. You can get through when things can get more difficult. If you had to do that on your own, another story. But because you have Jesus, you can not only be obedient, once you're obedient, but you can be completely dependent upon Jesus. So he's not looking for gifted people. He's looking for obedient and dependent people. Like I said, look at the 12 that he picked. And he says, I want you to go into all the towns. So he gives them. He says, okay, now this is not the house of Israel. I want you to go into all of these different towns, and I want you to share the gospel. I want you to tell them that the kingdom of God is near. Can I just say, the culture back then, not everybody was all happy that you were knocking on their door, telling them about the kingdom. And can I just say now, there are people today that don't like the fact that we are sharing the gospel with them. So what Jesus, what does he say? You don't need to force it on them. If they receive you, cool. You don't need to carry anything with you. Back then, the, the, the level of hospitality in that culture was that if somebody invited you and they felt that you were coming in peace, they welcomed you. So if the gospel was something that they wanted to receive as a family, they would open their doors. But not everybody's open to the gospel. So what does that tell us? Although we, we sing worship songs in here at our church gathering, there's a world out there that doesn't even care. And so if you go, go share the gospel with somebody and you, you get rejected, what does Jesus say? Don't get all hurt about it. Well, Jesus, they didn't receive me, man. I guess I must have messed this up. No, he said, shake that dust off your feet. Keep it moving. <laughs> Go to the next one that's going to receive. You don't got to force it down your, your boss's throat and your, your neighbor's throat. Well, they don't want to come to Easter. This is the 10th time I've invited them. Then stop inviting them. Like, imagine you're trying to drag your neighbor to church. Man, I brought him. Look at him. Look at him. I really work, Pastor. <laughs> he finally came after the 50th time. <laughs> Pray for the house. <laughs> Keep it moving. Why? I, I think that's ineffective. Like, like if, if, if God is saying, I've set more people up for you to oh, that's gonna open doors. God, I pray for those open doors to share the gospel. If God has got 10 more people behind him that's going to receive the gospel, why am I wasting time with the one trying to force? The gospel is not a message of condemnation either. It's a message of invitation. Why? Because there was a time where we wasn't readily receiving Jesus either. I remember people trying to give me tracks in my college days when I was partying. I, had, I didn't want nothing to do with him. Till the day my heart was ready and open. So I pray for those. So Jesus, like, as you move through the town, keep it moving. If they, if they don't receive you, that's okay. Just keep it moving. Shake the dust off your feet. 
But he is preparing them for persecution. When he says they will, he says this. He says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Now, I was like, if God could pick any animal in the Bible to represent. He could have picked a lion. I mean, he's a lion of Judah, right? Like, at least make us a cub, Jesus. I mean, but we're sheep. Look at this sheep. Oh, Lord. He's just a National Geographic meal waiting to happen. You got no, no defense. He just says bye. He can't even run fast. Like, give me the legs of a gazelle at least, Jesus, to get out. A harm's way. <laughs> Jesus, I'm picking the weakest one. And the cutest. Hey, but cute can't save you when a wolf is coming at you. <laughs> the wolf ain't worried about you being cute at that moment. <laughs> the wolf is licking his chops. Look at the wolf. Look at the wolf. Wolf waiting. So Jesus says, sometimes he's going to take us into environments that are very dangerous. He says, but I want you to be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. What does that mean? Like I got a strong conviction about my beliefs. But just because somebody doesn't believe the way I do, I'm not going to condemn them for it. Why? Because the only reason why I have that strong conviction about my lifestyle and the way that I live is because of Jesus. But I can also be winsome in my message and be inviting to them, right? I don't necessarily have to affirm everything I see in culture and the people that are around me. Well, geez, they're living together and this, that, and you begin to judge them. Well, they drink too much, therefore, no, they need a savior. The ones that drink too much need me. The ones that are addicted to the thing right now, that's their struggle. They need me. And so, yes, you have this strong conviction about you, but God says, be wise. In some moments, they don't need to be judged. They need to be loved. Be a shrewd. Pray for wisdom. Be fully dependent upon God. Here's what he says. He says, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. He says, when you are persecuted in one place, plead to the other. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Jesus is giving them a picture. I don't know if you knew this. Even I, I wanted to, to, to read this. So the 12 right now, even Peter that denied Jesus. Now, you could look at that moment in the Gospels when the, the, the disciples left Jesus. We're going to read that. They left him when he needed them the most. Can I just say, when they were in power with the Holy Spirit, when they realized there was nothing that they were afraid of, Peter crucified upside down. Bartholomew was beheaded. James stoned and clubbed to death. Andrew was bound to a cross, not nailed to a cross. Thomas was killed with a spear. James, son of Zebedee, was executed with a sword. Philip was scourged, thrown into prison, and, and afterwards crucified. Matthew, the very writer of this gospel, was killed with a spear. Thaddeus was crucified. Obviously, Judas Iscariot took his own life. John was boiled in oil, <laughs> miraculously survived. They say, oh, yeah, that was a, can I just say, if you were to look up the persecuted church today, we gather today in a nice air condition, right? Like if it got hot and we'd be like, oh, where's the AC company? Why are they not fixing that, right? Can I just tell you there are 365 million Christians right now being persecuted for their faith. That number represents one in five Christians are persecuted. Just imagine, they can't even worship freely. Like their Sunday morning is 
Are we going to get through the worship service before somebody kills us? Not like, I didn't like that worship song. Like, that worship song wasn't. Do you get what I'm saying? I mean, but when you're obedient to God, it don't matter. <laughs> when you're completely dependent upon God, it don't matter. He said, you're going to, and, and God is, the, the thing that God does is he says, as you get called into this dangerous mission, I'm going to also position you in platforms. Governors and kings, you're going to be my witness. But if you wanted a safe life and you just, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be obedient. I'm just going to kind of sit here and wait for heaven to come. And you take no risks in Jesus and you just sit here. Well, I'm just, I'm going to sit in my garage, wait for people to come to me. and God. I mean, that's cool. You'll still get into heaven. But what if God called you something dangerous, but he's like, I'm going to be with you. Would you be obedient to that call? Something that seems impossible. Something that causes you to take a risk and be dependent. It's like you don't even have to have Bible studies ready. I'm, I'm going to place you in front of platforms. And in that moment, I'm going to give you what to say. <laughs> Would you go? Possible mission requires you to be obedient. And in the same token, completely dependent. Let's keep it moving because we got a little bit more to go before we close it down. So Jesus says, verse 26, do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two spirits sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I got a couple more requirements. This is the third one. An impossible mission requires you to be courageous and confident. Now, I know some people struggle with this. I do, too. How, how many people are not naturally courageous? Can we just be honest in the house? It's like, I don't know, Jesus. Like, I'm afraid of failure. Like, I'm afraid of, I already start to look inward at my own self. And, and, and God is like, no, it, it, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is not the absence. But, but God, even in my fear, I'm going to be courageous. Why? Because I feel your, your spirit calling me out to do something, right? So he says, as you share this, do not. Be afraid. What you hear in the dark, in the daylight, what you hear in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who can't kill your soul. So what do I do? So when I travel on a plane, for example, I was sharing this earlier, I always, I always open my Bible. Now, I don't open my Bible necessarily to witness. I open my Bible because I'm praying to God that the pilot gets me to my destination on time. Not just on time, but safely. I had a scare. That'll be another sermon for another day. But I can't tell you how many times I've sat next to people. And they say, do you believe what you're reading? And I go, yeah. <laughs> and then what am I doing at that moment? It's an impromptu situation. Holy Spirit, give me what to say. Now, I remember flying one time, and this, this woman was downing these little shots of wine. She goes, flying always makes me anxious. And I begin to share the gospel with her. You know, Jesus can take away that anxiety. I didn't necessarily start with Jesus, but I just had to know her. Well, why do you feel this way? Oh, this and that. And then she began to ask me other questions. Does God hate homosexuals. Does God hate people that do this? Does God hate? There's no, I said, God doesn't affirm the lifestyle, but he loves the soul. And so God can love you through your struggle. I'm not looking for her to be saved by the time we get off the plane, but I planted the seed of Jesus. Why? Because I'm confident in what I believe. 
And so you don't have to be scared. Why? Because your message is good. The kingdom of God is the best message today. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is the best message. You can look at CNN. You can look at your TikTok or your X or your Instagram. Look for feeds and do all of that for your inspiration. But the last time I checked, this is the only inspiration that you need. He is still saving today. He is still redeeming souls. He meets people in their darkest places. It is Jesus. He is the hope of the world. So if you've got somebody sitting next to you or on your job or your neighbor that seems to be far from God, they're never too far from God. So share it confidently. Why? Because the results in terms of that soul being saved is not up to you. That is the Holy Spirit's job. Your job is to share it. His job is to save the heart. Man, that takes all the pressure off. <laughs> God, that's up to you. <laughs> Whether that soul comes, it's completely up to you. So he says, don't be afraid. I love this, he, this, this word, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the person that can kill the body, that can't kill the soul. Be afraid of the one that can kill both in hell. I remember going to Israel a couple years ago. The pastor had a church in some of the hardest places to reach, either in Jerusalem or God, I can't remember the city, and they would threaten him. They said, Pastor, you know if you bring that Jesus here, we're going to kill you. You know what he said? I'm already dead. <laughs> it don't matter. So I'm not going to be afraid. Why? Because the only thing that you could do to me is kill my body. But the moment that I die, I'm going to be in heaven with my Savior. So why am I afraid? I'm going to share it. Why? Because there are other people that need to know Jesus just like me. Let's continue, and we're going to wrap it up. Verse 32, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother. A daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies would be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to the one of these, to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Last point, if you are no takers, this an impossible mission requires you to be fully devoted at all cost. The acknowledgement of Jesus is your confession that he's Lord and Savior, right? So it's easy to confess that in here, but, but, if, but if you're in a situation and somebody says, well, why don't you act like the rest of us? What is your answer? Because I'm a Christian. It's great. It's awesome. A lot of people claim to be Christians, but not devoted to Jesus. How do I know? There was a story where a bunch of people with machine guns ran into a prayer meeting. And they threatened everybody in the room at the prayer meeting. If you are a believer in Jesus, we're going to kill you. But if you're not, you can escape right now, right? And so a bunch of people left. And a few stayed. And you know what happened? They put down their machine guns. They were like, we, that's good because we wanted to know who the real Christians were. <laughs> Before we continued with the prayer meeting. <laughs> That's devotion. Jesus is saying, it, it's not going to just be hard in the world, 
But in some situations, it's going to be hard in your own family. And where do I stand in relationship to your family? As much as I love my family, they can't be first place in my life. As much as you may love your family or somebody that's close to you, your full devotion as a follower of Jesus means that you give your life, heart, and service. But sometimes following Jesus brings division in your own home. Some of y'all get along with your Christian brothers and sisters than your own physical brothers and sisters. He says, yes, I'm the prince of peace, but in certain situations, I'm not bringing peace. In a way, I'm making you make a decision to test your devotion to me. So I have a question for you that I want you to answer. Are you a Christian? Any Christians in the house? Great. That is awesome. I have another question. Are you fully devoted? At all costs. So somebody walked in here today. Said that following Jesus is going to cost you your life. What would you do? Like, I'm not saying it to, to make you say yes. Like, I would be like, it all depends on what's coming in. I mean, the human, you can't, like, disregard the human heart. Right? We would be like, mm. But man. <laughs> but what if? At all cost. Knowing that you would be in glory with God. And sometimes it don't make sense to your family. I remember, this is my final story, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. I remember before I gave up the corporate world to follow Jesus. I remember having a real honest conversation with my father, great provider. And he says, son, it don't, it don't make sense to give up a job with benefits and retirement. And how are you going to provide for Jesus? How are you going to provide for your family? And I say, God's going to have to provide that. I don't. All I know is I got to obey the call. Now, 10 plus years later, my father looks at me and goes, man, son, I see how God, he's not saying the words faithful, but he's looking at our lives and he's seeing God take care of us time and time again. Can I just say, sometimes the at all cost is not necessarily life. It's when things don't make sense to you or anybody around you. You just got to follow. Because why? You're devoted to Jesus. And because you decided to follow him, no turning back. Because you're devoted, can I just say, in your devotion, God is faithful. He would be faithful to give you everything you need, not just the authority to go, but everything you need in life right now. So sometimes the cost is high, but you're devoted. But I bring it back full circle. Sometimes it's just simply, he says at the end, he says, if anyone even given even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones. And I was saying, maybe it is high, but maybe it's just... Going back to feeding in South Florida, maybe it's just giving a bag of food. It's not always the big things. Be devoted to Jesus even in the little things. And I was thinking maybe, I, and this is a challenge to me as well. Maybe God prompts you. Maybe it's in a public line and you say, God, you've been good to me. And you see Somebody pulling out food stamps or something. I don't know, but let's keep our eyes open to those that could be struggling in this season. It could be anything. To share, I don't know what that is. But maybe you just say, God, you have blessed me. Maybe you go to that mom or that family. You go, God has blessed me so much. I want to bless you. I want to be a blessing to you. I'm going to pay for your groceries. I don't know what that is, but what I'm saying, as a call to action, let's just not have that message be something we hallelujah today or amen today, but let's go be the church. 
Let's go see people that need healing. Let's go see people that need to be free. Let's go see people that we can help. And maybe it is an invitation to come to church, but more importantly, an invitation to be in relationship with Jesus. Can I get an amen, somebody? Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that, that God, you invite us, you empower us, you change, you transform. And even in this moment, we just pray that they, these would be defining moments. So, Lord, we just invite your spirit to continue to work in us. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you go, can I have my prayer encouragers? If you're a prayer encourager, could you come up now? I just want you to be up here now. Um, I want to have our prayer encouragers just maybe stand to the side a little bit. I feel like the Lord is like, hey, this could be a defining moment for you. I don't know what that moment is. But maybe you heard something today, you came in with something today, and you can process that moment with God alone. You just say, God, I want to come to the altar. I want to process a moment with you. And you can come to the altar. We'll leave this space open. But if you're like, God, I want somebody to intercede. I want somebody to pray over me for Maybe you're the person that needs healing. Maybe you're the person that needs to be free. Maybe you're the person that needs to know Jesus for the first time. And you go, I want a prayer, a prayer of salvation to invite him into my heart. Whatever it is, this is not forced or coerced because that's the one thing. I don't think God is trying to drag people to his altar. No. Let it be a move of God that moves in your heart to walk forward. And if you want prayer, you want to engage God on your own, this is open for you. If you want somebody to pray on your behalf, you come up to one of our prayer encouragers. So our worship team is going to play a little bit. If the Spirit is moving you to do something, this is your time. We'll be praying. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. We're going to keep the altar open, but 
I want to release you if you're like, hey, I'm ready to move to the next thing. Can we just join in prayer? If you're at the altar, you can stay. We'll be here for a while. If you feel led to stay because God is doing something in your heart, you want to come forward. We'll be up here for as long as you need. But let's pray together. Father, we thank you for moments where people encounter you. We thank you for every heart that's meeting you right now. We thank you for every prayer of intercession that's going on in the mighty name of Jesus. So God, do your good work today. You know exactly what to do in every situation. So with God, we pray for your spirit would just be poured out on hearts and souls today. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for meeting us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Could you just stand quietly? And so we'll be here for a while. God bless you. Hope to see you good Friday and Easter. If you want to stop by our Connect Point, you can. If you want to go to our cafe, you can. But if you can go out quietly so that way we can maintain a moment of reverence.